Folks, welcome back to another episode of Mayhem in the Mid-South. Today's episode, Murder on Timber Ridge. Folks, we're going to be in Mississippi, down in Biloxi, down there on the coast. Now, folks, my primary source of information for the retelling of this story is going to come from the state of Mississippi Criminal Court of Appeals. Now, it's the morning of August 26, 2008. Emergency personnel there in the area of Biloxi, they get reports of a house fire on Timber Ridge Lane. Now, that's in the north part of Biloxi. Now, the firefighters, they get the fire under control and get it put out, and they find a human body in the bedroom of the house. Now, they had to use dental records, but they identified the body as that of a 37-year-old woman named Michelle Lynn Crate. Now, the victim's autopsy showed that she had received multiple stab wounds to her back, and in addition to severe burns, that, uh, that literally destroyed her body all the way down to the bone. Now, I'm not going to get into all the gory details of what the medical examiner said. Just suffice it to say that the burns were pretty horrible and intense. Now, the ME did find as well, though, that the victim had a high level of carbon monoxide in her blood, which, of course, indicates that the victim was not dead when she was consumed by the fire. Now, according to the pathologist, he said that the stab wounds likely the cause of Miss Crate's death, and that she would have died from these wounds within minutes or hours without medical assistance. However, he noted that the stab wounds were also incapacitating and that the victim was not physically able to escape from the fire. Now, of course, the fire department, they called the police in. Investigators from Biloxi, they stand by on the scene, start their little investigation. Of course, a lot of that when you're talking about a, what gives all the appearances of being a an arson case used to cover up a homicide, you're going to have to rely on what the fire department tells you. Now, the officers begin their investigation from the outside of the house. The house itself still too hot to be doing any traipsing around in. Now, they found a red Ford Explorer parked in the carport, and check that license showed it belonged to the victim. Now, the officers also found a red plastic gas can sitting in the carport, and they would say later that it just seemed out of place where it was sitting. Now, the victim's body was laying face down on the floor of the master bedroom. So the officers, they took pictures of the scene. They said that the victim was so badly burned you couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman until they rolled her over. Now, Bluxy police, they call in the ATF, they're going to need their help for the fire investigation. Now, one of the agents, he brought his dog out there. That dog's trained to hit on the presence of any ignitable liquids. Now, according to the handler, his dog alerted 13 times in and around the victim's house. The dog had three separate alerts just in the master bedroom where the victim was found. Two alerts in the hallway, two alerts in the carport, and one on the porch. Now, according to ATF, the fire in the victim's house was intentionally set with the gasoline vapors being the ignition source. They said the gasoline trail traveled all the way from the gas can sitting on the carport through the kitchen, down the hall, and into the master bedroom. So now Biloxi police is getting cranked up because they're going to have to figure out who's behind this dastardly deed. So what police always do, they're going to talk to neighbors of the victim, family, friends, try to get an idea on just who might do this. Now, they found out that the victim had moved to Mississippi from Michigan in 2008 and had been in a relationship with our suspect. Now, their information also showed that the suspect had been living with the victim at the time of the fire. They also found out that the suspect, he drove a dark green 1999 Honda Passport. So, Biloxi police put that out advising the police they come across that vehicle to stop it, hold the occupant. Now inside of 
Miss Crate's Ford Explorer found receipts and items from the glove compartment. They were strewn all over the passenger driver's side of the vehicle. Now, the police did recover a Mississippi tax receipt and a Mississippi application for certification of title to a 1999 Honda. Both of them had the suspect's name on them. They also found the suspect's birth certificate inside the vehicle. So obviously the police are really focused on locating this suspect because he's nowhere to be found. So he's your obvious first suspect. So now the police begin their next phase of the investigations. They start checking the victim's bank and phone record, seeing what any of that shows. Now when they got in the victim's bank accounts, they found out that someone had used the victim's debit card the morning she died showed $500 had been withdrawn from a Bancor South ATM that was located in a Walmart store in Durbelville, Mississippi. There had also been a $418 purchase at the jewelry department of that same Walmart. They also saw a $116 purchase at a Shell gas station in Mobile, Alabama. So obviously that tells the police that the suspect is heading east. Now when the police got the still images from the ATM machine in the Walmart, sure enough it's the suspect's one that's getting the money. Police also found out that the suspect had purchased three cartons of cigarettes and an energy drink from a Mobile gas station and had forged the victim's signature on the receipt. Now, they interviewed the manager there at that Walmart. She said she remembered helping a fella purchase a diamond ring. Now, they showed the manager picture of the suspect from the ATM surveillance camera. The manager positively identified the suspect as the man who had purchased the ring. Now, they said originally the suspect had expressed interest in a particular ring. But the manager said, well, we'll have to order that ring. And he said, well, he didn't have time to wait. So he picked out a different ring. He bought it with the victim's debit card. And just to top it off, he got $100 in cash off the card as well. Now, they looked at the victim's phone records found out that the victim had two cell phones and that suspect had been using one of them. Now those phone records for the phone the suspect had showed extensive activity on the cell phone to a 904 area code. Now that area code is in the northeastern part of Florida. They further found out that there was a female that lived in Middleburg, Florida and that these phone conversations between the suspect and this female had increased in frequency during the two weeks preceding the victim's death. Now a few days prior to the victim's death, the suspect had sent this female a text message asking if she needed a television or an Xbox video game console. Now the morning of the victim's death, the suspect sent a text message to the female in Florida said he was loading up and coming to Florida. August 27th, 2008, so just a day after the victim's death, two United States Marshals snatched up the suspect and this female. They were leaving a department store in Jacksonville, Florida. Now they placed the suspect under arrest and they brought the female in for questioning. Inside the suspect's vehicle, they also recovered a knife. So now Biloxi police, they took off to Jacksonville, Florida, to go talk to the suspect and to this female. According to this female, had begun a online relationship with the suspect sometime in July of 08, so just a month prior. And that was while he was still obviously living with the victim. Now, this female said she knew that the suspect was living 
with somebody in Biloxi. And now it's her belief that the suspect was going to move to Florida and marry her. And she said she'd gotten a phone call from the suspect the night before the victim's death. And she said she had heard the victim yelling at the suspect in the background. She said the next day that the suspect showed up at her house, proposed to her, and gave her a ring. Now, that was the same ring that had been purchased at the Walmart. Now, the female went and visited the suspect in the pokey. Now, during this little meeting, the suspect told the female that him and the victim had gotten into an argument when he attempted to leave for Florida and that the victim had attacked him with a knife. Now, he further told the female that he had disarmed the victim and stabbed her when she threatened to get a shotgun and kill him. And the suspect freely admitted to this female he poured gasoline over everything and lit it on fire. Then he jumped in his truck and took off. Now he told her that the murder weapon, he had thrown it over the Bay Bridge before he got to Florida. And the suspect would later confirm that story in a letter he wrote to the female from prison in October 2008. The suspect said some very disparaging things about the victim in this letter, calling her a rich widow and an alcoholic millionaire who fell for him at first sight. Now, in this letter, the suspect goes on to admit that he manipulated the victim. He did more than that to the victim. Now, in this letter... He said that on the morning of the victim's death, he had told her he was leaving and going to Florida. She had slapped him and approached him with a knife. He said he had no intention of killing the victim. He said he again had emphasized that he only stabbed her because she threatened to shoot him. He said once he snapped out of it and realized what he'd done, he cleaned the knife off, changed clothes, doused the house with gasoline and set it on fire and drove off. Pretty well the same story he told her in person. Now there were no weapons found inside the victim's house. However, the police did find two unloaded shotguns stored in their cases in a studio apartment behind the victim's house. Now June 1st, 2009, grand jury indicted the suspect for armed robbery and capital murder with the underlying felony of arson. Now, his trial started October the 4th, 2010. The suspect didn't have any witnesses testify to his defense. October 7th, 2010, the jury convicted the suspect of capital murder and armed robbery. Now, the next day, they had the sentencing phase. Now, the state was asking for the death penalty and their evidence to support a request for the death penalty, it relied primarily on the evidence they'd already introduced during the trial itself. Now, the suspect, defense team put a psychologist on the stand, and she said that the suspect was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and ADHD early in his life suspect was susceptible to impulsive behavior. But now she did go on to say that the suspect's disorder did not significantly interfere with his ability to separate right from wrong. So their one defense witness didn't do him a whole lot of good. Now at the conclusion of the sentencing phase, the suspect was found guilty unanimous decision by the jury and that they sentenced him to death. As far as I know, the suspect still sits on death row in Mississippi.